Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you guys know about an opportunity to learn some of the most important skills in life, if not the most important skills, and those are the skills of learning and doing so rapidly, effectively, and easily. You see, guys, I'm putting on a completely free 60-minute webinar that you guys can check out where I will be going into my absolute best memory tips, learning tips, and speed reading tips so that you can immediately begin applying them and accelerating your learning of anything and everything. All you need to do to claim your spot in this free webinar is visit jle.vi slash webinar. We have showings at many different times throughout the days for every time zone, but you have to log in and claim your spot. So that's jle.vi slash webinar. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys achieve. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode I'm Jonathan Levy, and I have a review for you guys by Magical Miss Mariah from the US of A, who says, hooked on learning, five stars. This podcast rekindled my love for learning by making some of the most awe-inspiring specialists in their field accessible. The way Jonathan engages his guests with insightful dialogue while gearing the focus to ways his listeners can apply the episode to their lives keeps me coming back for more. I can honestly say that the episode featuring Sachin Patel has changed my life course and given me the perspective to reinvest in my mind-body goals as well as fortify my self-belief system as an individual who has struggled with health problems my whole life. Thank you for your commitment to and enthusiasm for learning. I must say, it's infectious. Well, thank you. Thank you for your review, Magical Miss Mariah. You know, I really needed to hear that review today because sometimes it's a lot of work to do a podcast and YouTube and 10,000 other things, and it's really, really nice to hear that the work is not for nothing. So if you guys haven't left a review, please do. On to today's episode, I'll start with a wow, and you're going to hear me, we're going to try and edit out all the wows, because I ended up saying wow a lot during this episode, and that's because my guest today is Andre Norman. He is known to many as the ambassador of hope, and the story that he tells is going to shake you to your core. Andre went from an extremely troubled childhood to prison, where he spent 14 years of his life and was sentenced with over 100 years. Today, however, he is a world-renowned speaker. He has worked with Harvard University, MIT. He's spoken in Honduras, the Bahamas, Sweden, Guatemala. He's been involved in turning around massive companies like Prudential Insurance, Bovis, Deutsche Bank, and so on and so forth. There's a huge list here of massive companies that you have heard of. And in this episode, we talk about how such a transition, such a turnaround is possible for anyone, but also for Andre. I had my mind thoroughly blown as to just what is possible when a human being commits themselves to change and how so much suffering in our lives can be turned around to help others who are suffering like us, like we once were. Super inspiring episode, and I know you guys are going to love it, so I'm not gonna spend any more time talking it up. Let me introduce you to my new super friend, Andre Norman. Mr. Andre Norman, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm so glad to finally meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you know, Brandon just raved about your 10-minute talk at Genius Network. The first thing he said when he came home, he was like, you have got to meet Andre. So I'm really excited. And thank you, obviously, again for another episode. Thanks to Joe Polish and Brandon for setting it up. Joe Polish is the man, and Brandon was a great guy to meet. Absolutely. He's actually going to be here. He's on a flight right now to come hang out for a couple months here in Israel. So I'm super excited about that as well. 
Oh, I have to come visit as well. I mean, it's definitely on a list of things to do for me. Please do. I've been trying to get Joe out here for a couple months. I think it's going to finally happen pretty soon. So that's exciting. So Andre, tell us a little bit, you know, I intentionally, as I was telling you before, didn't prepare for this interview because it's a rare opportunity for me to interview someone I know who is awesome and yet I don't already have preconceived notions of what I want to talk about. So tell me a little bit about your story, how you became known as the ambassador of hope. Well, the way I became an ambassador of hope was I was in need of an ambassador of hope myself. I grew up in inner city, tough circumstances, and my parents had a really tough time getting along as well, raising us. And you go through watching your mom get beat up. You go through that whole scenario of domestic violence. And one day um, my mom got tired of me and she put my dad out. At the same time, we went through the busing crisis where the kids would throw rocks at us and call us names because we were black. Went through illiteracy. I didn't learn how to read into the third grade. They used to have a thing called a dummy class. They put us all in like the dummy class. And it was just like tough coming up in the inner city with a single mom and five brothers and sisters. I get off track. I find my way to the street. I find my way to prison. I get to prison and it's just all bad. And while I was there, I had this goal of being like the top guy. So I went on this quest of trying to be the top gang member in the prison system and seven states two attempted murder convictions, five years in segregation later, I finally had an epiphany and I woke up and I realized that I was talented, I was smart, and the life that I was living was fake. Wow. And where did you grow up? Which city? I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. Wow. And so I hate to ask, but I have to ask, how did you land up in prison the first time? The reason I landed up in prison the first time was I stopped listening to my mom and I quit. I quit on life. I quit on my teachers. I quit on my band coach. I quit on my counselors. I quit on myself. Um, There was a lot of people who tried to help me. There's always a story that nobody cared. Um, I can't actually claim that 100 percent. Tons of teachers, for the most part, try to reach out to me and help me turn my life around. Even my juvenile probation officer tried to help me. But I just refused everybody's help and wanted to do it my way. And my way just wasn't a good way. So I actually went to prison for robbing drug dealers. That was my profession. If you were a drug dealer, I deduced you had money, money that I think you wouldn't mind giving to me. Right. And it was kind of, a, you know, steal from criminals. Is it probably less of a serious crime in your mind at the time? No, it wasn't about a crime. It was about you had the money. Wow. <laughs> it was as simple <laughs> as that. Drug dealers have cash. And generally lots of it. So I would rob drug houses. So wherever they had like the stash and they kept all the money, like the headquarters, I wouldn't rob a guy in a corner for like 10 bags. I'd go to the house where it was stored and I'd rob the drug house. Wow. How old were you at the time? 17. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And so then as I understand it, I mean, I, again, wasn't in the room when you met Brandon, but I understand that you were in and out for... No, no, no. I went to prison one time. I went to prison and went in once, came out once. No multiple trips to prison. And while I was inside and I finally had that epiphany and I woke up, I decided I wanted to do and be better. I started looking for mentors and people who could help me because I I understood the power of a mentor. I just didn't understand it when I needed to it as a juvenile. But as a 24-year-old adult, I realized I needed some help guiding me. And my first mentor, I met this guy in the unit I mean, and the guys were bullying him. I hate bullies. So I made him stop bullying the guy because at this time, I'm the third ranking gang member in the state. I said, hey, man, stop bullying that kid. And the guy came over and said, thank you. So I said, OK, no problem. He was a really tall guy. He was kind of slow, like mentally retarded. And he was doing a life sentence for something. I don't know. And he said, he said, hi to me. He introduced himself as Robert. And he said, hi. I said, hi. And like three times a week, I would cross paths with him walking through the prison. And he would say, hi, Andre. I'd be like, hi, Rob. And that was it. Then one day, I mean, I was never too cool to say hi to somebody. I got a lot of friends who were big time gangsters. And if you were a little guy, they'd like spit on you before they say hi to you. But I was never that guy. So me and Bob would say hi routinely three, four times a week. Then one day I was walking through the programs building. And I walked by an office, a program, and Bob was in there. So that went, let me go in and say hi to Bob. So I went out of my way, walked through the door and say hi to Bob. And he was sitting with another guy. He introduced me to him. He said, I said, what are y'all doing? He said, we're studying. I said, well, can I come study with you? He said, sure. It was just something about the guy that was like mad cool. So I sat down and started studying. 
I didn't notice the hat or the white shirt. It didn't mean anything to me. And the white stuff coming from this jacket, I didn't even know what it meant. I never knew what the feeling was. <laughs> Come to find out it was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. <laughs> Natan Sh- he's in Israel right now, Natan Schaefer. And for the next 18 months, Every Wednesday, me and Natan would I come to the Jewish services and people I like, didn't give you can't really give me a hard time because I punch you in the face or stab you. But people kind of like, Dre, what are you doing with the rabbi? You're not Jewish. But it wasn't about me being Jewish and him being black, him being from Israel, me being from the hood. It was just about he was a great teacher and he had the best stories. If you know anything about rabbis, if your rabbi doesn't have good stories, it's like, come on. Oh yeah. But he had the best stories. And that time we spent together, he taught me some things. First was responsibility, then ethics, then accountability. And most important, he taught me forgiveness. The key things he taught me was about how to be human. Nobody had taught me how to be human. I watched my mother be beat. I had kids throw rocks at me. I had some teachers banish me to the dummy class. Had people make fun of me for being poor. My whole life was just fight, 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 anger. And this man taught me how to be human. He says, Dre, there's another side to life. And to this day, we're friends. Wow. That was 94 we met. And to this day, I mean, that is my number one mentor, my number one guy. And that's why I'm coming to Israel for him. That is so cool. And I'm curious, I mean, did these lessons come packaged in a religious framework or was it for sure. He's a rabbi. I mean, we did the five books of Moses. We did the Torah. We did all the lessons. But my thing was the lessons may be religious, but they're still applicable to your life. Exactly. I mean, it's how to be a good person. It's how to be helpful. It's how to be kind. It's how to give back. It's how to think of others. It's how to treat your wife right. It's how to treat your neighbor right. And the key thing was it was just lessons on how to be human. That's how I saw it. That's how I took it. The blessing came because I walked through the door to be nice to a man that I didn't have to. And as a result, I got my best mentor on the planet. That's amazing. And I think it's really interesting. You know, I recently learned about kind of the origins of modern Judaism, even though growing up with it. And in uh, Homo Deus, I believe, Yuval Noah Harari's book, and he talks about this, you know, when the second temple was ruined, Prior to that, it was kind of a sacrificing animals, very, very different religion. And actually, and this is controversial if you believe that God wrote, you know, the Abrahamic texts, but at the time they kind of made this call, which was like, we have an opportunity to revise the way this religion works and turn it into something exactly like what you're saying, where it's more about how to live your life and less about praying to the gods that the wheat shaft grows. Well, he didn't do the wheat shaft one. He didn't do the wheat shaft. Right. I mean, we sang, I mean, he brought up a lot of, I met his wife. His wife is like one of the most amazing cooks you're ever going to meet. You know <laughs> so Shabbos on Friday at Natan's house was for real. But um, I grew up no church. I grew up no religion. I grew up against the church, against religion for a multitude of reasons. But um, him and his wife were just like the greatest people. And she gave me a psalm book, a Hebrew psalm book back in 95. And I kid you not, I sat with my son yesterday and I showed him the Bible I read when I went to a church program and everybody signed it. And I showed him the the book that the rabbi's wife gave me. I said, when I die, these go to you. Wow. Initially, they were going in my casket. But now these go to you and you're going to hold on to them because these are the two most important books that I have in my life. These are my prized possessions. And this is what I'm going to leave to you amongst anything else. But just know these two mean more to me than anything. That is so cool. And such a touching story also, because, you know, growing up Jewish, I always disliked this idea of Judaism that, you know, it's, we're not a recruiting religion, so to speak. And I love this story of one rabbi who saw past that and said, you know what, there are people here who could benefit from what this book has to share and not be exclusive about it. Oh, I poked at him. No, no, don't get me wrong. I tried him. I tested him. I'm saying I'm not just the most trusting guy on the planet, right? So I, I gave him some tests. I was like, yo, what's up with this? And what's up with that? And I know limited stuff about the Holocaust in Germany. So I gave him some pokes about Germans and I gave him some pokes about some other stuff. And I can honestly say any question I ever confronted Natan with, he only answered in complete love 
no BS. He only speaks love. I never met a person like that. And no matter what the topic or the situation was, only love came out of his mouth. And when you see that, you stand down. Wow. That's so interesting. What a like takeaway as well. Tell me about how things turned around. Today, you're known as the person that companies call when things need to be turned around from the worst possible scenario. Tell me about that turnaround. I'm sure Natan had a, a part to play in it. Teshuva, I believe it's called in, in Hebrew. Am I saying it right? Teshuva? Tshuva? The turnaround. Tshuva. Ah, tshuva would be answer. Teshuva. How do you say turnaround in Hebrew? Eh, lachzor, chazara, would be okay. like return. But there's probably an, many other words. There's a word that starts with a T that means turnaround. Because we had the discussion like, for some reason, way back in the 90s, when I was first mentioning them, that word came up, turn around. And I disliked it. And it was Teshuva. Don't quote me. And I'm quite sure there's a lot of people who are listening that can, but he's saying it wrong. Well, yes, I'm American. I tend to say things wrong. But um, <laughs> people call me because of two things. One, I'm the guy you call when you need it done. When you're done, when you're finished playing and you're finished with the high tech and the high end and the people coming in and with great reports and great charts and the meetings, when you just want it and need it done, mm -hmm. I'm not coming in. I'm not playing games. I'm not hugging you. I'm going to go get it done. Then after it's done, we can do all the personable stuff. After it's done, then we can go hang out and have something to eat and talk about the family. But when you call me in, I am going to show up and get it done. And that's where I come from. When I was in prison, I came from a world of get it right or die. If you were in prison, you made a mistake, you died. It's that simple. If you weren't paying attention, you went down the wrong hallway, five guys from opposing gang would come kill you. If you were in a fight someplace and you weren't up to speed, you didn't do your training and you were slacking on your running, you ran out of energy, you would die. I'm saying if you weren't paying attention, you die. So it's real simple. Get it right or die. That's the understanding that's been burnt into me. It's been beaten to me. That's been tortured into me that if you don't get it right, you are subject to die. And it's a mindset. Now, so when, I, when people call me, I show up. They had riots in Ferguson, Missouri for a year and a half, and they couldn't get the riots to stop. It was some of the worst riots and protests in our country's history, recent history. And they called me and I came in. And I went out into the streets at not two o'clock in the afternoon when all the wonderful black leaders had done. I went out at two o'clock in the morning with the brothers out there with guns and they were angry. And I talked to them. I didn't talk to the aunties at two in the afternoon. I talked to the angry black men at two o'clock at night and we got a resolution. And I was able to talk to the city, the city people, the mayor, the police chief and some other folks. And we were able to come to a resolution and get a mediation and sit down and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And we ended the riots. Then we walked away. Where did that skill, I mean, at some point you had to develop the skill to survive in prison. Tell me about that process. Well, growing up in the house with my mother, you learn survival, you learn to be tough. My mother's a great lady, but she's a tough lady. And <laughs> she's like verbally tough. She doesn't like scream at you, but she's mentally challenging. And I thought all adults were as smart as my mom until I actually went outside and I found out that they weren't. But she's extremely mentally challenging. She's the type of lady where you would do something wrong and you thought you got away with it. Then like a week later, she'd be like, listen, now two weeks ago, you told me a lie about where you was at two o'clock. I know you was over there, but I let, I let it go because I didn't feel like arguing with you. You're like, I thought I got away with that. And one time she told me, you keep sneaking out that window and you need to stop that because I'm like, oh, you thought I didn't know. I could close the window, but then you're just going to find another window to go out of. And I feel like searching through the house. So I let you out of that window. Wow. And she would just always play mental games with you. And you had to be extremely, extremely thoughtful to deal with my mom. So people say, oh, you learned how to be tough in jail. Oh, no. Cheryl Ann <laughs> taught me how to be tough. Way, I had some gang leaders and some bosses who I dealt with that taught me some skills and some tools, but mom taught me toughness. Wow. I watched her deal with a lot of stuff. She tried to raise six kids by herself at a time where it wasn't easy. She went through a lot of trauma to get to where she was and where she is, and it wasn't easy. Prison took it to another level, but my toughness, 
my attitude, my caring, my drive comes from my mother. Wow. That's incredible. And so I want to take us back to the period in prison because I read in your bio, you were originally sentenced to 100 years and you literally practiced what you preached. You turned everything around because you had a dream and a goal. Tell me about that turnaround to really take your life into your own hands and change everything. Well, I was actually in segregation, locked up 24 hours a day for the most part for trying to kill eight people. And while I was in segregation, there was another situation where I was going to attempt to kill seven more people. But before I could do it, God spoke to me. And God said, Andre, don't do this life choice. And when God told me don't do this life choice, I got mad that God was speaking to me. I'm like, why are you bothering me, God? See, all of my life, there's been no God. My mother used to get beat to the floor. There was no God. When my father walked out on us, there was no God. When those kids threw rocks and names and called me a nigga, there was no God. When my sister became an addict and a prostitute, no God. When I was stuffed in a dummy class and left, or kids made fun of me for dirty clothes, there was no God. So I don't know why you're bothering me. There's a ton of people who scream and pray for you daily. I'm not on that list. So why don't you just fall back and let me do me? And me and God argued, but at the end of the argument, he won. And I didn't stab anybody that day for the first time. And I went back to my cell and there was nothing floating. I didn't speak in tongues. It was just a dusty state blanket in the, in the state toilet. And I said, well, what am I going to do now? If I can't be a psychopath, then what am I going to be? And God blocked the psychopath line hard. And I came up with the concept. I want to go home and I want to be successful. The initial thought was be free. And I looked around my all my demographics and there's nobody going home from prison and not coming back. Everybody went home and came back. So free didn't work. So I switched free for successful. And I set a goal and a dream. I said, I'm going to go home, go to Harvard University and be successful. Nobody believed me. Everybody thought I was crazy. But I went back to school, got my GED, went to the law library, taught myself the law and started fighting in a court for my freedom instead of fighting on the yard for respect. And I won in court, took 10 years off my sentence, and I just kept going and going to programs and going to programs, going to programs where I met Natan, I met a lot of other folks, and I convinced the parole board that I should be released. So after 14 years and too much trauma later, the parole board said, we're going to give you a chance. And I said, that's all I need is one. So I didn't, this isn't a second chance for me. This is a first chance. And I said, you gave me one. And I hit that door November 15th, 1999. The first thing I did was went to the parole office, then went to a youth center. I started talking to young kids about why they were going to jail. I told them they were going to jail because they were emotionally distraught, not because they were black, not because they smoked weed. You're going to jail because you've been let down. Now I'm going to show you how to manage your emotions and your life and you can have a better life. And I've been on that track for eight. November will be 19 years. So 18 and a half years I've been doing this. Wow. Hats off to you because that's, Such an incredibly rare story. You know, I studied sociology at Berkeley and one of the most painful discoveries, there were a lot of painful discoveries studying sociology at such a liberal school, but just realizing first off the race dynamics of incarceration in the world was heartbreaking, but also realizing that this so-called system of rehabilitation does anything but and that it, it's so incredibly rare for someone who's been incarcerated to actually be able to turn things around because of a lot of reasons, but also because of the way the system is set up. Well, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and he made it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, if you study, I mean, there's a lot of people who, from the Holy Text who happen to have been incarcerated at some point in time. And so not that I compare myself to any of them, but... It's part and parcel of the world, and it has been. So I'm just saying that from the context of people have dealt with incarceration since the early days. It's not a new concept, and it's never been fair. I'm sure it was always that demographic that people didn't like or thought was less than who made it to jail or prisons. Right now, in this era, it's black folks. So it's simple. Black and brown folks go to jail. Well, Back in the day, there was no black and brown folks in certain parts of towns, and they still had jails. They have jails in China. It's just 100 percent Chinese. They have jails in Egypt. It's just 100 percent Egyptian. So right now, where does the chosen people to have to deal with incarceration? It goes in cycles. We weren't the first to be enslaved, and we're not going to be the last. So slavery didn't stop with black folks. It's just one of the worst chapters 
of the generations that, that had to deal with it. Right. I don't condone it. I'm not happy about it. But when you look at history, it didn't start with black folks. Right. So, you know, I had this idea to ask you a question about kind of the things that you learned while you were incarcerated, because it's clear, you know, as you said, the first thing you did is you came out and you started speaking to youth. So I, I want to rephrase that question. And I want to ask you in your day to day life today, what are the things that you learned in prison lessons that you've been able to take out and really create lemonade out of those seven years, or I'm sorry, you said 14 years. 14. I wish it was seven. I'd have taken seven. Right. You could have been my judge. So what are those amazing lessons? Yeah. The lessons that I apply today is every day is beautiful. I used to sit in a prison yard and I trained my mind because I'd been in prison so long and so hard and so focused on being a psychopath that I stopped being human. So I used to sit out in the prison yard on the bench and I'd look up at the sky and I would see the clouds and I would tell myself, those clouds go over the whole world. This place isn't real. And I would see trees like over the wall. I'd be like, those trees are real. And I mean, see birds fly by. You stop focusing on life and on nature when you're in prison because everything's cement, everything's bars, everything's hostile. And that's your focus and that becomes your life. So I literally spent hours just sitting in a yard saying that wind is free. Those trees are free. And it's not that wind goes beyond the walls. There's life outside of the walls. They have a psychological trick that comes with prison that makes you like hunker down. And those things people now do at their workplace. They go to work and it's a prison. They're in relationships. They're in prisons. I mean, they're in jobs that they hate. They're in relationships that they're not doing their best at. And they've tricked themselves into believing that they're in prison and they're not. There's a larger world out here beyond your job or beyond your occupation or beyond your relationship that you have to find yourself before you can actually embrace somebody else. And I had to find myself. And I found myself sitting in a yard, staring at trees, feeling the wind. I found myself sitting in a room, listening to a rabbi. I found myself just the key thing that I say I'm really, really good at is reflective listening. That is my number one super skill. You say, what am I superhuman at? Listening. That is my top, top, top skill. And is that something that you developed at home or something that really you developed over these 14 years? I mean, I would say I developed it over 14 years. I perfected it over the 14 years. Being able to hear people's pain, being able to hear people's joy, being able to hear people's confusion or their lack of confidence, hearing what people aren't saying. You can hear what people say out their mouth, but what are you hearing was not being said? Can you hear their thoughts? Can you look at their life and see beyond what they have on or don't have on or the cool shoes or the old shoes? Can you hear them? And those are the things that make a difference for me now, because when I go into a domestic violence situation, when I talk to somebody who's on drugs, I see somebody who's in a company trying to take it to the next level. You have to be able to hear their soul. You have to be able to hear their pain or their dreams or their vision, then tap into that and help them move. And that's my number one human skill is the ability to actively listen at another level. Well, and it connects really nicely with what you said earlier, where in prison, this was a survival skill. If you weren't paying attention and someone was communicating, even at the subtlest level, that they wish you harm or, or whatever it might be, I mean, this was a life or death skill for you. I used to teach people, if you don't know somebody wants to kill you until they show up at your cell door, you're dead. I used to wake up every morning at 530 and I sit on the edge of my bed and I would say, who's going to try and kill me today? Not who wants to. I don't care who wants to. The wants, I don't care. Who's going to try today? And I would look at all the variables and the people moving through the jail and the scenarios and I'd figure it out who it was. And I would go see them first. I have to get to them before the thought registers in their mind that, oh, I'm going to try to kill Andre today. I can see the variables. I can see the, the lines. I can see all the movements and the moving pieces. I said, OK, based on everything that I see, Johnny's going to try today. 
because all the stars line up for him to think he can get away with it. So I would go see him and have a conversation I'm like, hey, John, later this afternoon, you have this great thought. What's that, Dre? You're going to want to kill me. He was like, get out of here. We're friends. I said, no, no, no. See, Hector and them just came back from the other jail. Your cousin has got a lockup and two of my guys just went down. So you're going to realize later on that you think I'm weak and it's your greatest time to move on me. But I'm just here to tell you that it's not. And we would have that conversation and it would head off a lot of stuff. I had many conversations like that and it deterred people actually trying to kill me. Wow. Because it only works if they think you're not paying attention. This blows my mind so much, Andre, because, I mean, you and I both know Annie Hyman Pratt, who is also in Genius Network, runs Impact Entrepreneur, and I've joined her next level kind of training. And I always comment, what's really, really funny, is I always comment that I think I'm very privileged to be in a room with an all-female team learning leadership, because the stuff that you need to do as a leader has changed. And the 1980s style of like, do it or you're fired, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, doesn't work anymore with males or females in the workplace. So I always say, I think I'm really lucky to be able to learn in an all-female team. But you know, what you just said right now is like the same skills that Annie's teaching. And it's blowing my mind that like leadership in a prison gang is the same and communication because ultimately leadership is all about communication is the same in this prison gang as it is in an all female run consulting company. And it, it just blows my mind that it comes down to these communication skills of like, it, literally what you said is exactly what Annie would say like, Hey, are you thinking about this? I get a feeling that you're thinking this. Let's talk about that. Right? The difference is if she misses, okay, you lose a couple of dollars, you might lose a client. <laughs> If I miss, I might <laughs> I might lose a couple ounces of blood. Wow. If you want to be the boss, that's not for everybody. When you put yourself in a position of leadership, I'm in the third ranking guy in the prison. I'm the boss in those prisons. So I control the commerce. I control extortion. I control drugs. I control everything. So people want my job. Imagine as the CEO of your company, I work in the mail room. If I catch you going to the water bubble, not paying attention, I run up and stab you three times. I'm the boss. Just, you walk to the water cooler kind of different, wouldn't you? If any of your interns could just like cut your throat and take over your company, what's that? Yeah. It's, it's very, very, very eye opening and just super fascinating. So you get out and you start talking to people. Walk me through that journey. I mean, I think it, it says a lot about how interesting your story is that we're still on the biography part. We haven't even gotten to the questions I'd prepared. Okay. I came home. And my goal was to go to Harvard University and to help people. And again, I had to go have dinner with Natan, even though I wasn't supposed to because he worked at the prison. But um, I didn't care. He didn't care. He cared about me more than he did his job because it's a violation to actually interact with inmates after the route. But he invited me to his house. I met his family. I had Shabbos with him. And he's just like, that's my guy. And I just started working in the community, working with different um, all little black kids in the city, I was a guy. If you a little black kid in the city who was acting up, you called Andre. And we'd come over, gang involved, drug involved, just not paying attention, unmotivated. And we work with every black kid in the city. Any black boy that was having a problem, they called us because that was a crisis. Then somebody said, Andre, can you talk to the girls? I'm like, I don't even think about being a girl. But I started talking to girls. And I realized that their lives were 10 times harder than the boys because they just got way more issues and pressure. And then you throw the sex thing in and esteem and this is all bad. So I started working with little black girls who had esteem issues, who had daddy issues, who just had everything else. Then it was like three years in, a lady came to me and she said, Andre, um, you're denying kids. I'm like, get out of here, lady. I work every day, 20 hours a day. And she said, no, you won't work with kids because they're white. I said, white kids ain't got a problem. This is their country. It's their country, it's their world. They own all the companies, they own all the teams, they own all everything. They own the government. I mean, white folks have no problems. And we argued for a while. Then and to shut her up, I agreed to go to an all white school and talk to the kids. So I went to an all white school in an affluent town. I'm not going to say the name of them because they didn't do anything wrong. And when I got there, it was a really, really nice school. They had a, like the student parking lot with the nice cars. I'm like, we steal cars when I used to be in high school. These kids got a parking lot. It was just like just confirming that I know they will spoil <laughs> rich kids. 
Spoiled rich kids don't have problems. I came at the door. The nice white lady met me. Hi, Andre. How are you? Thank you for coming. I'm like, yeah, lady, whatever. And we'll walk, I mean, it's like a beautiful building. And we walked down to the auditorium, which is like state of the art, like some amphitheater. I'm, sorry, I'm like, what is this? This is like, we got like a gym. <laughs> These people got like a state, they got like studios. I'm sitting there and the kids start filing in all dressed up, looking nice. Just confirming spoiled rich white kids. And I started talking to them. And I found out they do drugs at the white school. We kept talking. They got bullies at the white school. And we kept talking. They're having sex at the white school. They got kids who don't read well at the white school. They have kids whose parents have been beat up by their dads at the white school. They have kids who don't fit in at the white school. And I was like, I was blown away. I'm like, how can you be rich and white and have all these problems? It was because I didn't understand white folks. And I didn't understand their lives. I just assumed that because they were white, they lived in the suburbs, they had a great life because I'd never been there. And come to find out, it was just as hard for their kids as for our kids. Being 15 is tough, regardless where you grow up and regardless where your parents are. When I walked out of that school, I had a simple concept. If you call me, I'll show up and never again will I say no based on my ignorance. And I just started helping everybody. I said, if my phone rings, I'm coming. My phone rang, I went to Guatemala. My phone rang, I went to I went to Sweden. My phone rang, I went to Australia. My phone rang, I went to Ferguson. My phone rang, I went to Honduras. My phone rang, I'm on the phone with you. And I was out in Phoenix. So three years out, I went from helping black kids to helping everybody. But that's wow. where I started and that's how I progressed. And I started working with companies and I started working with anybody that was like, hey, Dre, these business people need your help. I would have said before, they own a multi-billion dollar company. They don't need me. They do need me. Your job and your bank account doesn't dictate how much pain you're in. Your company and your title doesn't dictate your ability to actually solve a problem. And oftentimes when you don't have, you think people who have have it better. Wow. And I was in Sweden. There's a guy in Sweden. I just say he's one of the richest guys in Sweden. Great guy. And he brought me over to do a week of outreach. I'm going to substance abuse centers. I'm going to juvenile centers. I'm going everywhere over this. He, this guy paid for everything. And I'm just running around the city doing all these talks. Then I went to his house to visit him. And needless to say, he had one of the nicest houses in the country. And it's in the nicest. It was He actually bought his dad's house. So it was like one of the nicest houses in the nicest neighborhoods. It was like right on the ocean. The ocean was frozen, which I'd never seen before. And we walked out on the ocean and we're talking. I said, let me ask you a question. As a poor black kid, but this is a poor kid. We had this dream we should do. We should dream. I'd buy that house. I'd buy that car. I'd buy that boat. I'd buy that plane. And you just daydream about all the stuff you would buy. You're a billionaire. You've literally bought everything that you could buy and everything that you ever wanted. What do you do now? And he looked at me and said, Andre, he said, I'm going to consolidate my businesses. I don't need to open anymore. And then I want to start helping people. I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference. I want to help people change their lives and do better. He said, why do you think you're here? He said, I want to learn what you're doing. And he just totally ruined my life. <laughs> he ruined my life. <laughs> I wanted to be rich. I swear to God, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be a billionaire. I wanted to have everything that anybody else could have, would have, should have wanted. My goal at the end of the day, even though I was helping people, I had it in the back of my head. I wanted to be rich. And the richest man or one of the richest men in the world told me, I want to be like you, Andre. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to make an impact. I want every day to matter. And I would have spent 20, 20, 30 years of my life trying to be rich. I could have gotten it. Then I'd have been sitting on my house in front of some ocean or some beach and some young kids starting up with a cane to me and said, Andre. You're a billionaire. You have anything in the world. What would you want? I'm going to say, I used to be like you. I want that again. Then I looked around and all the extremely wealthy and doing well people from the Oprah's to the Bill Gates and the rest of the world are trying to give back. There's like a long line of super rich people trying to get in this lane of helping people. And I was trying to get out of that line. So I was like, you know something? He confirmed my lot in life is to help people. And if money comes, money comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be measured by how much money you make, by how many lives you touched. So I stayed, I doubled down in the helping people business and stopped focusing on being rich. Wow. 
I'm really glad to hear you say that because it is so easy, especially today, you know, when that line becomes blurred in our industry, like selling online courses and books, and it's really easy to focus on the metric that's easiest to measure, which is how much did you sell and how many units and how much money came in. How's this for you? I've never sold a book, 18 and a half years, never sold a book, never written a book. I've never sold a course. I've never created a course. Don't have any products. You go to my website, there's not one product that you can buy. I don't have a wristband. I don't have a, a notebook, a journal, nothing. I've never had it. And the only reason I considered creating courses wasn't to make money. I mean, I write, I take my life story, I put it in a book, cool. People buy it. I've had 100 people a day ask me to buy my book that I don't have. I have a choice. I can spend time writing a book. I can spend time helping people. I spent my time helping people. Somebody else can tell my story. The only reason I considered creating a course wasn't to make money. It was somebody convinced me I could help more people if I put my thoughts and my trainings, my focus into a course because I can only get to so many people. Exactly. So that's what made me not to talk with the brand and then talk to other folks. It wasn't my whole, I can make some money making these courses. I don't have one, 18 and a half years, I don't have one product to sell. Any product that comes, comes with me. Andre shows up. <laughs> you can't buy a book or a handbook. You can't buy a book of quotes, photo lab, nothing. The only thing you get from Andre is Andre in person. I totally get it. And you know, that's how I got into courses is so many people were pulling me aside and saying, how do you do that speed reading thing? Or how do you remember all this stuff that you remember to where I got to the point where it was like every lunch I was having was me trying to explain stuff. I was like, you know, if I just recorded this, people could watch it anywhere in the world and not just people I know, right? Like anyone out there, regardless of budget or where they are, could watch this stuff. And we should wrap about online courses for exactly that reason. I mean, we've managed to touch 150,000 people's lives and I haven't been doing it for a fraction of as long as you have. Yeah, I mean, so I'm in a place now where people are saying, Andre, it would be selfish for you not to take the things that you know and share it with people because the things that you know, the things that you do, not just make companies better, they save lives. Absolutely. And that's what, so we're doing a forgiveness panel and actually we're doing two things. We have this fall, we're doing a forgiveness panel. There was a gentleman in Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown, who was shot by a police officer and died, Darren Wilson. And it's been turmoil and trauma and anger ever since. It was before and it has been doubly since. And this fall, I've been mentoring Michael Sr., in this fall, we're going to have a session where Michael Brown Sr. and Darren Wilson are going to sit on the panel and Michael Brown Sr. is going to extend the hand of forgiveness. Wow. And that's from Natan. That's from Mr. Oliver. I can give you a list of people who taught me forgiveness. So I'm teaching Michael Sr. what Natan taught me. And I'm demonstrating in Michael's life what Joe Polish has done for me. You help people to be better because that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Tell me a bit about how you know Joe, just out of curiosity and the role that he's played in your life. I met Joe probably like three months ago and somebody introduced me to him. I met a couple of guys, Michael Burnoff, great guy, and Cameron Harold, great guy. And I was hanging out with them in Phoenix, and they both said to me, you have to meet Joe Polish. So we went to lunch, and I we met Joe, never heard of him before, or Genius Network. And five minutes into the lunch, he says, well, I hate what you do. I hate what you're about. He said, okay, Andre, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay your bills for the next five months. And all I want you to do for the next five months is focus on you getting yourself in a place where you can really go to the next level. Met this man 10 minutes into the conversation. He said, I'm going to pay your bills, all of them, for the next five months. I don't know you. Nobody put me up to this. I believe in your spirit. I believe in your mission. And I have to invest. I have to pay into or invest into what you're about. Wow. And he went back to his office the next day. He wrote me a check. And he handed it to me. He said, you'll get one of these checks for the next five months. 
Don't worry about it. It'll be there. You don't have to ask. Don't have to send an invoice. It'll be there. Go be the best you. <laughs> Such a Joe Polish story. Wow. Then he invited me out to attend Genius Network. And I came and again, you know, people are paying twenty five, one hundred thousand dollars to be in the room. And I'm probably the only guy being paid to be in the room. Mm -hmm. And I sat in the room and I didn't actually give a 10 minute talk. He just had me introduce myself. And but while I was there, I do what I do, which is help people. So there was a member there and their brother was having a hard time with drugs. So I shot out that night. The first night I went and saw the brother and convinced him to go to rehab, convinced him to get off drugs. And he's in treatment to this day. And we still talk. There was another gentleman, his son. Um, this is a really, really high ranking, great guy, businessman, 25 years, tons of money, tons of great life. Extremely great guy. Son, nuclear meltdown. We jumped in the car. We drove two hours. I stayed in some hotel, waited all night to meet his son and did an intervention with his son. And his son is 30 something, he's 33 years old, helped him get a turnaround. There was another gentleman. He said, hey, Andre, I got a friend who's in California. His son is on drugs. Can you call him? Can you help him? So we called the dad. We get on the phone to dad. And I say, hey, this thing ends. It's Thursday, Friday. I can be out to you Saturday. And we can help your son. We'll go find him. We'll do intervention. We'll get him on track. We'll get him in some kind of counseling or programming. And the guy couldn't reconcile, in my opinion. He's a nice guy. but no issues. He couldn't reconcile this like six foot two black guy from the hood trying to fly out to like suburban whitey, white area and help this little white kid. He's like, Yo, you want to help my little white son? And you're some like six foot two black guy. From there. There's no correlation. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> he couldn't rectify the correlation between my life and his life. And there's no fee. I'm not charging. I'm paying my own plan. He just, I could hear it. That personal block and his own issues was like, he's like, okay, let's do this next week. This isn't a good week for me. I'm like, God, I'm an hour away. I can fly out there. I got you. We'll go find him. We'll do this. And he, again, the apprehension was more the issue between me and him than between me and his son. And it wasn't anything bad. It was just life history. He probably hasn't dealt with black people. He's an extremely wealthy white guy, lives in the suburbs, never had to deal with black folks. And now all of a sudden, this strange black guy with a 14 year prison history is coming to your house. And he, he couldn't wrap his mind around that. So he needed a week to process he said, we'll do it next weekend. I said, well, okay. That was Friday. His son OD'd on Monday. Oh, my God. And it's terrible. The guy that introduced me told me, said, the guy's son OD'd and died on Monday. And it just made me write a, a speech that says, next week may never come. And I felt for the guy because he lost his son. And there was a really good chance I'm, I haven't lost yet. We'd have got him in the treatment. There's no question in my mind, had I got my hands to him, he'd have gotten the treatment and he might still be here today. Wow. So my message is to a lot of folks, you, like my mentor came in the form of Orthodox Jewish Rabbi. I'm some six foot two gang member from the hood. And this little tiny white dude came in and changed my life. Had I been like, man, you're Jewish, you're white, you wear funny clothes. I'm saying you got this big thing going on. I ain't rocking with you. I'd have lost out one of the biggest blessings of my life. So it's hard for people to come out of their social enclaves and engage with other people. This is life or death. If help shows up in the form of a six foot two black guy, take it. If the help shows up in the form of a five foot two white lady, take it. But again, we get on our own ways. So instead of listening, he didn't listen to see if I was the guy. He played tapes in his head about why I shouldn't be the guy. Andre, I know we could talk all day. It sounds like we're going to have to do a follow-up call and I'm really looking forward to meeting you, but I want to be respectful of your time. And I also want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience, I know you don't have courses or books or anything yet, but where can people reach out, learn more, hear you speak, check out some of the work you're doing? If you want to find Andre Norman, the easiest thing you do is go to andrenorman.com. I try to keep it simple.